Good morning. You are all requested to take your seats. Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Bombay Seward Medical Association and HN Reliance Hospitals. Uh, popular CME on the first Sundays of every month. So you are welcome. And may I request Dr. Asha Vasani. She is the president of Bombay Seward Medical Association to welcome you all today. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Seaboard Medical Association and Bombay Medical Union, I welcome you all for today's session. Very interesting session today and eminent speakers to speak on obesity, which is a continuous burning uh, problem, especially in the urban setting. So I invite Dr. Mehta to continue and start the session. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, may I start with that yesterday, the 4th March was the World Obesity Day. Now, why it has been introduced? It was introduced way back in, I mean, 2015. It was recognized much earlier. But obesity has tremendous long-term uh, health and socially and economic impact on our lives. So that has been very well recognized. But what has happened that obesity has not been in a limelight like other all other diseases, etc. So this time, a very peculiar theme has been created that let's talk about obesity, changing paradigms. So let's talk about obesity. And that is what we are going to do, address today. It has been beautifully designed by Dr. Mufi Lakrawala and uh, Priyanka that you know, we have covered, try to cover each and every aspect which can affect obesity and obesity affects those aspects of our healthcare system and our life. So it has been a nicely designed program. Today, we are starting the first with Dr. David Chandi. Uh, see, human body has been, uh, you know, it has been such mechanized to fight starvation. So that our internal body doesn't allow us to lose weight. And that is the biggest challenge that we find all of us, that how to manage and maintain the best possible weight. So we start with the endocrinologist and diabetologist, Dr. David Chandi, consultant and section coordinator of the endocrine department at Sir HN Reliance Hospital and Found uh, Hospital. He has completed his DM endocrinology from uh, Lucknow and he is reviewer of the World Journal of Endocrine Surgery and British Journal of Nutrition. He has extensive expertise with ailments related to diabetes, bone metabolism, and adrenal gland. A very good orator with academic zeal is actively involved in teaching. So may I request Dr. David Chandi to start today's program. Me here. So today we have an interesting discussion on obesity and hormones. So a very simplistic view of obesity. A very simplistic view of obesity is that it's a consequence of positive energy balance. That is, it can result from increased energy intake or decrease in energy expenditure, or both. 
But like Anas has mentioned before, it's not such a simple thing. You know, it is basically a misalignment of failure in body's homeostasis or the various hormones regulating body's homeostasis. So if you look into the various hormones that protect body's weight, they start from leptin, insulin, ghrelin, adiponectin, and estrogens, androgens, and growth hormone. So how do these hormones interplay with our body's weight? So we start with the very first hormone, that is leptin. Okay. So leptin is a 30-year-old hormone. If you see, it has an effect on multiple different parameters. It's, leptin has an interplay with your immunity, it increases the blood pressure, it regulates thyroid hormone and insulin hormone, it causes tachycardia, it regulates your bone metabolism, it's responsible for your bone health, also for menses. But the most important is the regulation of body's energy balance and appetite. Interestingly, the word leptose means thin. So like Anil sir said, like, you know, our body is protected, you know, so that we can prevent famines and starvation and we can survive through them. It's derived from the obesity gene. It's called OB gene. It's secreted from the white adipocytes in the adipocytes of the body. The basic signaling mechanism, the defense was to protect body from starvation. So whenever there is starvation, it indicates that the body's fat stores are low and the leptin levels should start declining. So whenever you're fasting or you're on a prolonged low calorie diet, your leptin levels should decline. That is the inherent reason why leptin is there in the body. So whenever leptin levels go low, you feel hungry and you need to eat. So that's the body's basic defense mechanism to protect body's weight. But what happens in obesity? Nowadays, we don't have any famine or starvation. We no longer are away from food. We have an abundance of food. So what happens? Huh? Leptin is basically secreted in proportion to your adipose volume. So if you have more adipose tissue, there'll be more leptin. So good, right? If there's more leptin, your appetite should come down. But that is not what happens. Like obesity and diabetes, we know. What happens in obesity and diabetes, you have insulin resistance. A similar phenomenon occurs over here. You have leptin resistance in obesity. So people who have obese do have high leptin levels but the leptin is ineffective at the level of the brain, where it should, at the level of the hypothalamus, where it should stimulate, you know, you know, the center over there, and it should reduce appetite. It does not work over there. So the, it is ineffective in reducing appetite. Interestingly, this resistance does not occur at the peripheral level. So at the level of the intestines, at the level of the muscles, leptin can work. And over there, it increases the glucose production. So this leptin resistance is selective to the brain. At the level of hypothalamus, there is leptin resistance. So remember that in obese people, you get leptin resistance. Now again, let's compare this with diabetes. You know, there are two types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes with insulin deficiency and type 2 diabetes with insulin resistance. So the same concept over here. Currently, we classify obesity into two types. Type 1 obesity is similar to type 1 diabetes. That is the leptin levels are low. You have leptin deficiency. So obviously, if you have leptin deficiency, you give leptin, the person would improve. This is classically seen in children who have congenital leptin deficiency. So you have if any children who are from birth, who have early onset severe obesity, please get their leptin levels done. If their leptin level is low, you have diagnosed congenital leptin deficiency. In adults, it can occur as a type of lipodystrophy, which is not HIV related. In them, again, if you can measure leptin level and if it's low, leptin therapy can be effective. In fact, recombinant leptin has been US FDA approved for these two conditions, congenital leptin deficiency and non-HIV related lipodystrophy in adults. But this is a minor group of patients who have leptin deficiency. Majority of the people have type 2 obesity, like type 2 diabetes is the majority type of diabetes. Here you have leptin resistance and here leptin replacement is not the optimum treatment. It could be used, but it won't give the best results. Other therapeutic approaches are recommended. We'll dwell into the other options later on. Now coming on to the other hormone. So this is the other hormone. This is called ghrelin. 
Okay. So the leptin comes from adipocytes. This comes from the stomach. It is the hormone that increases hunger. So, you know, around lunchtime or din dinner time that, you know, hunger pangs that you get, it's basically because of gurlin. What does it do? It increases gastric emptying. It also reduces insulin secretion. And at the level of growth hormone, it causes growth hormone release. In fact, that is how it got its name. If you look over here, GH stands for growth hormone, REL stands for releasing. So it's the growth hormone, releasing hormone. But the major role in the body is to increase hunger. So before you eat food, gurlin is the predominant hormone. Leptin level is supposed to be low. When you eat food, what happens? There's a drop in the gurlin because now your stomach is full with food. So what happens is after you eat food, there should be a drop in the gurlin because now you're full. You don't need to eat more. But unfortunately, in obesity, what happens? This drop in gurlin does not occur. In obese people, there's a failure to suppress gurlin level after meals. So what occurs because of this? People tend to eat more frequently. People who are obese, have you seen that? Many people of your patients will complain. The doctors are, we want to eat every one hour or two hours because the gurlin is not working. They are not feeling full and they are feeling hungry always. So the grazing pattern in people who are obese is because of the gurlin hormone, which comes from the stomach and it should reduce after you have your meal, but it does not get reduced in people who are obese. So just to a quick revision, we have two hormones. You have the gurlin, which is the appetite stimulating hormone. It basically creates hunger in the body. You have the opposite, which comes from the fat, that is leptin, which causes satiety. In obesity, gurlin level drop does not occur after food. And in obesity, there's a leptin resistance. Now coming on to the next hormone. So do you all know which is the largest endocrine gland in the body? It's nothing but the adipose tissue. Huh? Adipose tissue is the largest. There are more than 20 to 30 hormones coming from the adipose tissue. And it's a huge, you know, the body has huge amount of adipose tissue. 20 to 30 percent of our weight may be adipose tissue. And the maximum production of the hormone that comes from the adipose tissue is adiponectin. And in fact, adiponectin is a good hormone. It reduces your glucose output at the liver. It increases the glucose uptake of, at the muscle. So it burns off the glucose. At the heart, it reduces inflammation. So it reduces the chances of stroke and MI. It reduces diabetes. It reduces insulin resistance. But it does not affect your appetite. Compared to gurlin and leptin, it has nothing to do with appetite. But it affects your glucose level and your inflammation at the heart. It's a good hormone coming from the fat. But unfortunately, in obesity, the levels of adiponectin contraindicate, it goes down. You think in adipose tissue, there should be, you know, in obese people, more adiponectin. But studies have shown that adiponectin in obese people level, it goes down. Because it goes down, obese people are more prone for insulin resistance, poor lipid levels, and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, coming back to our old favorite hormone, insulin. All of you all know that insulin coming from the beta cell of pancreas is very important to regulate the body's fat. But whenever there is excessive fat, you have insulin resistance. So if there's insulin resistance at the level of liver, the liver will release more glucose. If there's insulin resistance at the liver of the muscle, muscle will not be able to pull in the glucose. So your blood glucose levels will start going up. What is the effect of insulin on the lipids at the fat? So insulin basically, you know, affects the lipoprotein lipase level. And whenever there is insulin resistance, there is more breakdown and there is more release of lipids in the blood. In fact, we have a patient right now in an ICU with a triglyceride level of 2000. What do you think would be the treatment of that patient? Insulin infusion. Okay. The treatment of choice for anyone with a high triglyceride is nothing but insulin infusion. In fact, that patient had diabetes, ketoacidosis also. So if you give insulin infusion, you shoot two things at, you know, simultaneously. When you give insulin, you will reduce this you know, plasma lipase activity. So what happens is uh, the fat will prevent from releasing triglyceride. So one of the best treatments, remember, to lower triglyceride is nothing but insulin. Unfortunately, in obesity, you have insulin resistance. 
because of which you have PCOS, metabolic syndrome, and in long term, you have type 2 diabetes. Now, the next hormone, incretin. Now, all of us have used, you know, gliptin so many times. They are the safest medicines for diabetes. Very rare side effects. But how does it work? It comes basically from the intestine. So, we talked about stomach. We spoke about fat. Now, there's some hormone that comes from the intestine. This is the L cells of the intestine. So, one hormone is called GLP-1. Other one is called GIP. So, what does this do? It has something called ileal break. That is, once the food comes into the intestine, it reduces the gastric emptying. So, the food stays longer in the stomach. It slows the nutrient absorption from the intestine. So, the glucose absorbed reduces because of which it has good postprandial glycemic reduction. So, with your gliptins, bildagliptin, setagliptin, you get good blood sugar control. And also, it enhances satiety because there's more food at the level of the stomach. You feel full fast. Even at the level of hypothalamus, it causes satiety. So using this, now we have powerful medicine called GLP-1 agonist. All of you all would have heard about previously Victoza, then Trulicity. And now we have, you know, Ribelsis or Ozempic. And, you know, these drugs have got good results both for sugar control as well as for obesity. Also, it suppresses glucagon secretion and it promotes insulin secretion. Now, this is very interesting. The insulin release by GLP-1 is dependent on your blood glucose level. If your glucose is high, then only your insulin level is high. If your sugars are low or normal, it will not stimulate insulin. So, it will not cause hypoglycemia. The other drug that stimulates insulin secretion is sulfonuria, your glimipride and glycoside. But that all of us know and we have experienced it can cause hypoglycemia. But these group of drugs do not cause. Now, what happens in obesity? So, if you look at the small study done in around 40 people, the green you know, dots are the people who are normal and the squares are people who are obese. So, normally if you have a food, what should happen? Around 10-20 minutes after having food, there should be a spike in the GLP-1. And if the GLP-1 goes up, you will have this ileal break effect. Your stomach will feel full. Your gastric emptying will be delayed. So you will not feel like eating more. It will reduce your glucose level. And you will feel full. But in obese people, in this lower line, if you see, what happens? Instead of it spiking after food, there's a paradoxical drop. So after eating food, your GLP-1 levels in obese people drop. So you don't have this ileal break effect. But if you could synthetically give GLP-1 and you know get the GLP-1 levels up, then you can reduce the blood glucose level and you can promote satiety. And if you do these two things, you can treat diabetes and you can treat obesity. So that's what is done. If all of you all have been following latest medical literature in the last one or two years. In US, these two drugs are now in black market. You can't get these two drugs. It's so popular. Many of the Hollywood top people and the big industrialists and the you know, rich people in US are on these drugs. In fact, Elon Musk tweeted about this drug and within a week, you know, it went out of stock. So many diabetes people can't get now semaglutide because it's taken more by people who want to get their weight down. And obese people are more than type 2 diabetes people. So this is semaglutide, which has been approved by US FDA up to 1 milligram for diabetes and up to 2.4 milligram for weight loss. It's a GLP-1 agonist. It reduces appetite. So don't start off with high doses immediately. Your patients will never tolerate. Always start slow and start low and go slow. Start with the lowest dose. Don't have, expect much of sugar control and much of weight loss with the lower dose. But it will make the patient comfortable. Then gradually you step it up. The weight loss results are good. In this June, they also published, so you know, there are two big companies in the field of obesity. One is Novo Nordisk and the other is Eli Lilly. So they keep on competing with each other. So this is the European company and this is the American company. So the European company got FDA approval around two years back. So the Eli Lilly guys then came up and they launched the other molecule called Tirzapride, which is GLP-1 plus GIP agonist. So it will give double the effect. So when they studied for diabetes, the results were definitely better. And even for obesity, the results were better. So the study, you know, was published in NEGM. So if you see, they included around thousands of patients and the average weight was around 104 kilos. And by the end of 72 weeks, which roughly comes to 14 to 15 months, 
people lost around 20% of their weight so people lost from 104 they came to around you know in their 70s they lost a huge amount of weight so it's become very popular but it is expensive any guess what would be the cost of this drug how much ha huh, so that is the oral tablet this is the other one this is the newer version called tirzapride or monjuro someone i said lacks ha huh. so it's 1500 us dollars for a month so it would correspond to i think around 1.2 to 1.3 lakhs in a month so now the tricky thing is if you put someone on this and you know how do you get them off this so that is what we need to think you know you start this drug you get good weight loss but what do you do next if the patient is not made motivated for you know good diet good exercise good nutrition then it's tough to get them off so treatment for obesity should be a thing where multiple partners are involved you need to counsel them well on motivation you need to counsel them on having good diet and exercise then you could get this drug off them otherwise they'll be on this drug for lifelong now coming on to the other hormone called growth hormone so growth hormone all we all of us know it comes from the pituitary gland again it's a good hormone it helps in burning of fat but in obese people there's a decrease in the growth hormone production and also because of obesity there is a reduction in the growth hormone receptor so there is growth hormone resistance in addition because of increase in insulin level and decrease increase in leptin level resistance you have further there's a decrease in growth hormone so at the level of pituitary the growth hormone level reduces and there's more growth hormone resistance other thing in addition to hormones there's lot of inflammation also occurring at the adipose tissue so if you talk about the chemicals in the blood there are two things hormonal changes as well as obesity is a chronic inflammatory state at the adipose tissue so there's a chronic low grade inflammation and the cortisol levels are also slightly high the stress reaction stimulates the cortisol and many of this pro inflammatory factors further stimulate the growth of fat cells and they will lead to a vicious cycle now coming on to another important aspect the gonads the testosterone and in females the ovary and pcos so there are two effects one is if there is testosterone deficiency it leads to adiposity so if there is low testosterone there is more fat mass and because the fat mass increases it worsens the hypogonadism and because the testosterone is low all of us know if the testosterone levels are low your muscle bulk will be thin that's why many of the athletes and movie stars take testosterone supplements to increase their muscle bulk if there is testosterone deficiency and that causes obesity definitely testosterone replacement is indicated and the person will do good both it will improve his bone density muscle mass and it will also reduce his obesity now coming on to the other side what is the effect of fat on testosterone so if you see obese men hypogonadism in obese men is as prevalent as 25 to 75% huge proportion of obese men have low total testosterone and low free testosterone predominantly at the level of you know the gonadism the hypogonadism is due to pituitary effect and a small degree at the level of the testis so it's mainly secondary hypogonadism and little bit at the level of testis other effect of the adipose tissue is on the fat of the body a fat contains an enzyme called aromatase all of you all may have used an enzyme called aromatase enzyme inhibitors so when you have this aromatase this converts testosterone to estradiol so if there's more fat you will have more estradiol so in men who are obese they have more estradiol so you would have seen many obese men with gynecomastia the reason for that gynecomastia is this testosterone estradiol shunt the fat in the you know belly converts the testosterone to estradiol because of aromatase now because of this decrease in testosterone there is an increase in the abdominal obesity so the cycle is called the hypogonadism and obesity cycle so low testosterone leads to obesity obesity leads to more low testosterone now coming on to females all of you all have seen plenty of cases of pcos so what happens when the central obesity there is more circulating androgen levels in females at the level of the liver when there's more insulin in the body at the level of the liver sex hormone binding globulin reduces shbg is important to keep the total testosterone in a bound format so it won't go and act at the receptor but when there's less shbg the testosterone becomes free testosterone 
and it acts as a receptor more. So you'll have more hirsutism and more acne. Lots of studies, especially from UK, have shown that if there's more obesity in children, it leads to early menarche. And with early menarche, you have more obesity, you have more breast cancer, more cardiovascular risk, and more type 2 diabetes. So it's important that we control the weight even in children. It's very important from that age. What about PCOS and obesity? Around two-thirds of the women with PCOS are obese. Majority of them have insulin resistance. With PCOS, what happens is you have masculinization of the adipose tissue. All of us know that in the males, the adipose tissue is predominantly in the abdomen region, and in females, it's in the thigh. So with PCOS, there's more deposition of fat in the abdominal region. This is called masculinization of the adipose tissue. There is increase in the visceral adipose tissue, that is your abdominal fat. And even the adipokine or the hormone secreted by the adipocytes resemble a male pattern. So there are three effects in obesity and in, you know, related to PCOS. One is you have insulin resistance. Because of that, you have higher insulin level. If insulin is more, that will stimulate the ovary and the adrenal gland to release more androgen. If there is more androgen at the level of ovary, it will affect the follicle growth and you will have anovulatory cycles and infertility. So let's look at the couple of diagrams from NEGM. So these were around 10-year-old pictures in NEGM explaining very beautifully the pathophysiology of PCOS. So it all starts from here. Obesity leads to hyperinsulinemia. The insulin level at the brain, at the hypothalamus, affects the hormone signaling. So this is at the level of hypothalamus. It preferentially makes more LH and less FSH. So PCOS is an LH, you know, high state. LH level is high and FSH is low. What happens? If the LH is more, at the level of ovary, LH stimulates the thicker cells. Thicker cells can make testosterone. And at the ovary, the thicker cells hand over the testosterone to the granulosa cells, which then, with the help of aromatase, make estradiol. But the granulosa cell is under the control of LH, FSH. So, jo FSH, that controls the granulosa cell. But in PCOS, like we said, LH is the predominant hormone. So the theca cells will make more testosterone. It will hand it over to the granulosa cells, but there is no signal and no stimulus at the granulosa cell. They are sleeping. So the testosterone can't be converted into estrogen. That is why in females you have more androgens in PCOS. Now coming on to the other effect of high insulin, like we said, the insulin resistance in diabetes or in PCOS is predominantly for the liver and to the muscle. There is no insulin resistance at the level of ovary and adrenal. So the high insulin level at the level of adrenal gland will make more testosterone and more DHEs. Now DHEs is the androgen from the adrenal gland. Similarly, the high insulin level at the level of ovary stimulates more formation of androgens from the theca cells. So this is the basic pathophysiology of PCOS, why you have more androgens in PCOS and why is insulin responsible. But why does body make more LH? So who controls LH and FSH in the body? Who is the master hormone that controls FSH and LH? It is GnRH. So we have only one hormone called GnRH. Sometimes it decides to make LH. Sometimes it decides to make FSH. How is this possible? Is it possible how one hormone can control Two different hormones which work opposite. It depends on the pulsatility, you know. So, like you know, in music, it's very important of you know how the sequence of the music, the sequence of the tunes. So, similarly, in GnRH, if the GnRH rhythm is slow, the body will make FSH. If the GnRH rhythm is fast, the pulsatility is fast, the body will make LH. So, LH and FSH both need GnRH, but they need the frequency of GnRH also. It's very important. High GnRH with high frequency, you will get LH. High GnRH with low frequency, your body will make FSH. So this control is decided by insulin. When there is more insulin, the body will make GnRH go faster. So there will be higher LH. Higher LH, like we said, will make the theca cells work more. The granulosa cells are sleeping. Why? Because FSH levels are low. To go slightly off target, the, the pulsatility is again very important for another one endocrine thing that we all usually see. 
all of you all have seen people with renal failure right with high pth and osteoporosis correct it is why because the pth in renal failure the pth levels are high that is why you get osteoporosis but have you all ever wondered for osteoporosis many doctors orthopedics endocrinologists also use teriparatide have you all heard of teriparatide is nothing but a recombinant pth the first 34 molecules of pth is nothing but teriparatide so how can this hormone which cause osteoporosis used for the treatment of osteoporosis all of you all agree right teriparatide we use for treatment of osteoporosis so again the cyclicity or pulsatility is important in ckd pth is constantly high when the pth is constantly high what happens your bones get weak and you get osteoporosis but when you give teriparatide once in a day it's a pulsatile signal it stimulates bone formation so remember that hormones it's not only the value it's how you give the hormones it makes an important difference to the body now coming on to the last few slides we have something called secondary obesity till now what we were discussing was primary or exogenous obesity that is without any obvious cause but sometimes when a particular hormone is quite off target you get secondary obesity all of you all have seen thousands of hypothyroidism patients whenever your hypothyroidism patients come to you they have low metabolism the fat cannot be burned so what does the guideline say when should we evaluate for secondary obesity so all patients because hypothyroidism is so prevalent in mumbai's population if you do anti tpo 10% of the female population will have anti tpo positive around 5% of the female population of a city will have hypothyroidism it's so common so hypothyroidism you evaluate for each and every obese patient but other conditions like excessive cortisol or pushing syndrome high cortisol levels in the body you should only evaluate if there is clinical suspicion similarly hypogonadism if the person has poor libido then you evaluate in a male for hypogonadism in a female if there is irregular cycles or features of pcos or acne then definitely you evaluate for pcos growth hormone deficiency again growth hormone treatment is very expensive if you suspect hypopituitarism if the pituitary gland is weak you are suspecting that then definitely get an igf1 level and growth hormone levels done so the take home message we have four glands that release hormone with respect to the adipose tissue which is the largest endocrine gland in the body what happens to your leptin in majority patients you have leptin resistance which is called type 2 obesity in a small proportion of young children you will have leptin deficiency and in adults there is something called uh, lipodystrophy which could also be because of leptin deficiency there you can treat with leptin adiponectin which is the major hormone made by the adipose tissue it's a good hormone but paradoxically in obesity the levels come down in the pituitary and the gonadal axis what happens in obesity in men testosterone levels come down in females both shb levels comes down the testosterone levels go high that's why in females you get pcos at the level of stomach which is the hormone released by stomach ghrelin which is the hunger hormone so what should happen after having food the ghrelin should come down but in obesity unfortunately the ghrelin levels don't drop the last is the intestinal hormone which was that glp1 so again that's a good incretin it causes the ileal break it makes you feel full but unfortunately in obese people the glp1 levels are lower after you eat meal so that's it thank you i hope it was useful uh uh we had a we have a question answer time but uh, will you be there otherwise we can ask yeah so uh, we will be there for one yeah so there is one question from my side you know what is that myth around the intermittent fasting how it helps and how it doesn't help or there is a new controversy which has been created about it very good question i mean also you know patients come and ask us about intermittent fasting and how it benefits so the thing is intermittent fasting does had good benefits one of the main reasons is when you eat for a less amount of time your insulin levels would be lower so the insulin levels are lower insulin stimulates fat production so the fat production would be low but 
the problem about intermittent fasting is the sustainability. If you look at the data published in various journals over the last 10 years, they all trials had a small duration between three to six months. But if you have someone who prolongs it, we need to treat obesity not for six months. We need to treat it for the next 10, 20 years for the entire person's lifetime. So in the long-term trials, the results were not so good because it's tough for a person to maintain that schedule. Around 10 to 15 percent people can maintain it. And those who maintain it do definitely get good results. So the results are good, but only a small proportion of patients can actually sustain the intermittent fasting. Now, there are various different regimens. You know, whatever the people are comfortable, they could follow that. And they would get results. It would vary from person to person. But it's a very uh, tough thing to say yes or no. Is it a good thing or bad thing? So it does work. It does work for short term. But in the long term, it's a challenging thing to manage. Fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, in the beginning when I introduced Dr. Chandi, I said he's a fantastic teacher. And such a complex matter, you know, all this uh, entire hormonal chain and you know, very, very beautifully, you know, practically explained. So we are thankful to you. So to start with now, that again, if you look at, if you just Google about what is obesity load in the world, they are expecting that about 1.9 billion people will be suffering from obesity from uh, in 2035. And they have calculated the economic impact equal to about 4.3 trillion US dollars by 2035. So imagine the impact and imagine what we are dealing with. So it can be comparable with any other uh, healthcare hazards or healthcare problem. Second problem, again, coming there is that lifestyle buildings, which we are seeing daily and they are now everybody shifting. Last, last night, I went to one of those lifestyle buildings and they proudly said that everything is available in our building. You ask for something and it is there. So food marketing and the complexity of that business, at the same time, availability of ultra processed food, which is a part which has become part of a young lifestyle, husband and wife, nuclear family, both are working and ordering food daily from outside. This becomes a real major issue. And I think it is a major role. It has plays a major role in obesity. So to start with today, we have Dr. Bhumika Pandya. She's a certified nutritionist and nutrition consultant under the Indian Diabetes Association. She has pursued her BSc in food and nutrition and a postgraduate diploma in clinical nutrition and dietetics with specialization in diabetes and cardiac care from SVT University, Mumbai. Holding a nutrition-rich decade of experience, Bhumika is currently heading research and product development at Soul Food. So may I request Dr. Bhumika to come over and uh, throw some light over this. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for introducing me, and thank you, Dr. Mofi, for having me here. So I'll quickly dive into my topic of obesity management with protein. Like very much, as much as it sounds so familiar, I like to highlight some aspects related to protein and how it is so important for obesity management. And there's a strong relationship between protein and obesity. Highlighting one factor that I like to put as, as my point first is losing weight without calorie restrictions. Now. Just by modifying your micronutrient intake distribution throughout the day, we all are heavy carbs eaters. So here I don't talk about having high protein diets, but merely just meeting your protein requirement is going to indirectly shift into consuming lesser calorie and it's going to make you burn more fat. And that's the next top point that I wanted to highlight here that it burns more fat, mere because the nature of protein here has a higher thermic effect. 
So it's much more than carbs and fat. If you see, it's 20 to 30 percent more than carbs and fat when you consume protein, dietary protein, or coming from supplements or other rich foods. So this is the second point that consuming protein more will help you burn more calories compared to fat and carb. The third most important point, which is in relationship with obesity, is it reduces appetite and provides satiety. So like I'll just add up and I really appreciate Dr. David sharing the detail and relationship between how hormone and obesity is. So protein here is in when you consume protein, it increases GLP-1. There is slower gastric emptying of proteins. It gives you satiety and suppresses the hunger hormone, which is a girlin that Dr. David just mentioned about. So here adding protein in your diet, not just by your, you know, the concept of high protein diet uh, plans or something, but just making sure that your normal day routine has a good spot for protein with carbs and fat, a good ratio distribution among them helps you achieve this by default without intentional restriction uh, in carbs and fat. So the last point that I like to highlight that as much as said weight loss brings along a lot of positive effect in your body, but it has two major side effects, which we tend to, you know, and that's what we see in consumers. We tend to forget that there is muscle loss and there is drop in metabolic rate, which is not supposedly, it's going not, the, the entire purpose of weight loss is nullified. And protein here plays a major role by making sure that the muscle loss which occurs in the catabolic state is reduced it's all as much as it's prevented and the metabolic rate is also maintained here so th these four are the main aspects which really strongly links protein with obesity management and having said that protein also has a major influence in diabetes cancer post surgery I i've seen patients i just like to uh, share one of my patients quoting that I eat vitamin D, I eat vitamin C, I eat multivitamin, yet there is prolonged fatigue that I'm experiencing. What should I do? And when we do a mere evaluation of their diet intake, we realize that I just need to make sure that my patient is consuming enough protein and meeting the daily protein requirement. And that gives, that solves the purpose altogether. So this is what I've seen even in the interstitial lung disease patients consuming steroids, long-term steroid intake. How they have, because of steroid intake, there's muscle loss and there's muscle de depletion. In that, these patients have a lot of muscle aches and pain. They have, so, they, their immunity is decreased. They have high inflammatory markers. So your protein plays such a crucial role, role in reducing the inflammatory markers and in eradicating all those pain and aches that we have. So this was one more point that I wanted to highlight. Also bariatric surgery, if I may say. The entire purpose of bariatric surgery is fat loss, not just the numerical weight loss. So when someone goes through a bariatric surgery, the, there is a different, there's a change in the metabolic system. And in that, if I don't take protein, and we see a lot of poor compliance of protein intake, dietary supplement are talking in, in general. So what happens here is there is also fat loss. There is also muscle loss with the fat loss. And all this can be prevented, even the faster recovery, decrease in infection rate, Im Im improving the immunity status of the patient. Protein plays a very crucial role here. And, and I remember I just like sharing the point during our COVID days, I'm sure all of us relate to this. The happiness that we achieved when we could transfer our ICU patient to HDU by dr dropping those CRP levels and, and how crucial the role of protein played role over here when we used to struggle to you know, make sure that their two eggs are given in the breakfast or protein supplements are given twice a day, managing the sugar levels. And having said that, of course, we know the struggle that we had those who were renal compromised. So here, I just wanted to bring across the point that protein is somewhere there is some lack of perception or, or there's some where somewhere we're going wrong where we when we when we quote that so much, so many places protein is playing a role, and we also know the daily function that protein involves is, is into. So non-essential amino acids, of course, will play all of this role. But having said that, if my essential protein amino acids is not consumed, all these functions are going to be compromised. So overall, the point that I like to establish here is that we understand the need of protein. We understand the emergency and the urgent requirement of protein. 
and if you see all of these snack right now pictures of the snack we see protein has entered everywhere we see protein rich chips cookies biscuits we have peptide based creams we have hair keratin treatment protein has entered the market every spot you play protein has got into all of this so there is popularity there is awareness also of protein but it's 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 astonishing that still there is protein deficiency and this and the more surprising part is that the in the educated groups the the degree the percentage is almost 44.6 compared to the non educated so where is the issue in consumption of protein so there so why do we still fail to meet our daily protein requirement and that's all that we need to achieve as a step one rather than moving to high protein diets moving to other different types of keto diets or intermediate fasting per, per se but i think if we just take care of our basics by meeting our protein requirement that's what i keep telling my patients i think that solves our, that solves the major purpose and the major issue is getting sorted over there so we do fail and and that brings into That, that there is some where failure in meeting our daily protein requirements and these are the common challenges which you keep hearing and i think it's time that we should address all of these challenges because we can no more move forward as a healthcare professional by saying that you know you have to make sure that you eat protein because we have patients front of us having a hectic lifestyle they are frequent travelers they are they have suddenly someone has got detected pre diabetic They, or there is or there are habits like i cannot consume dal they make me feel gassy that's genuine and even if someone you see a nine uh, under 19 child who are planning to enter state level or you know into football how is that child going to have a recovery of muscle without the amino acid spike and without the proper intake of protein so these challenges need a bit different way of addressing and i think it's time that this were the traditional sources of our protein like every time when we we see our patients coming into our consult and we tell them that you know you can consume animal protein or plant protein there are different sources but let us also highlight these two also as protein sources we have protein rich products coming into market haldiram is coming with a mutter mix mix pulse we have so many brands coming and making the products rich and protein supplements also over there since the beginning but having said that as a as a nutritionist i also had my doubts that whether what i'm saying or what i'm agreeing to my patients coming with three four cookies all are saying high protein so is it good or bad i don't know so just to bring across all that i have gone and learned through my journey that you know how do we estimate that you know what i'm prescribing or what i'm agreeing to that yes you can consume that if you're traveling you have a hectic schedule you could include this protein bar or you could include this mul- this multi grain pulse snack savory then what should you see these are the small check how do we assure so these are the small checkpoints that i have created to share with you all where these are the things that we could keep in mind when you see any protein rich product so first the ingredient list as a regulatory fsi every product is is into under the fsi regulatory and ingredient list are put up in their ascending order so whichever is the first ingredient put up in any packet is the dominant ingredient in the product so when is someone uh, so i understand there is too much of marketing claims in the front panel but i think uh, if we see the back side of the label we can understand all the facts over there so if it's a beverage and quoting it to be rich in protein and if the first ingredient is maltodextrin or if the first ingredient is sugar i know for a fact that's not something that i would like to agree with or ask my patient to consume it so i'll see the list of ingredient been put over there also the method of pre- preparation of that savory or snack there are so many different novel food technologies growing in boom it's it's growing so largely there are methods like vacuum dry vacuum frying which is a better way better method of making and uh, and that is much more better than the fried snack there is oil extrusion method these days that are trending in market where they have deep fried and the oil is extracted out now i don't mean to convey that everything is healthy over here but definitely rather than not consuming protein all together and struggling not to meet your daily protein requirement if we include these maybe we will be able to support somewhere or the other also very very important here where you can analyze is the protein quantity and the source of protein now 
if I know that the quantity of protein mentioned in the package is for 100 gram, but the pack is almost more than 100 or less than 100, then I need to know that, you know, how much protein per serving I'm consuming. The claim would be 25 grams per, uh, per 100 gram, but the packet is just 10 gram, a snack. Then I know the protein is hardly 8 or 5 gram, then that doesn't qualify. So something like that, also the calorie, also the total fat, it may be a vacuum dry or, or, or a roasted product, but if the total fat content and the saturated fat is high, I understand that I can take I can take a decision of, over here that this is does does this product does not qualify, and of course added sugars there are million hidden sugars in the product market currently, so we can at least see in the ingredient panel we can understand which one should I pick and which one is not there. So this is way, this these are the seven checkpoints that I personally followed in my practice to see whether you know I can agree and prescribe them. Similarly for protein supplement as well. The same supplement that is sold for 2,000 is also sold for 7, 8,000 out there. The same amount of kgs. Here, what is important to check is the type of ingredient. If protein supplement is my primary product that I need to give to my... If protein is what I want to supplement my patient, then the major ingredient, the dominant ingredient has to be protein. Now, in the nutrition label, if the protein is lesser than the carbs, it's not a protein supplement. Though it says it's a protein supplement. But when I see the label, the carbs are much more than protein. It makes no sense for me to prescribe that supplement. So here, this is the point that I see the sequencing of the ingredient. Also, the source of ingredient. I see so many protein supplements running in market saying that this gives you 28 nutrients and minerals. 20, 12 uh, vitamins and minerals that, that is getting covered. But when you see the back of the label and you read somewhere like vitamin and mineral pre-mix, that is nothing but a synthetic ingredient which has zero bioavailability. So basically, there's no absorption of that. So that's when I understand, no, then this is not something that I would like to go forward with. And the sweetener. Sweetener plays an important role if my if I'm going to make sure in case if my if my patient requires protein supplement and it's going to be filled with artificial sweetener then again, it makes no sense for me to you know, pre prescribe this. Digestive enzyme is another third most important point that I make sure that I see is because there are many studies that have, that many open label clinical trials have been conducted using digestive enzymes in protein supplement. And they've shown that when you add a digestive enzyme in your protein supplement, the amino acid spiking is much more better than those which do not have. Now we understand the protein, when you consume protein, the transit time is really very fast. In that much window space, the absorption of protein is so, so very essential. And in that, digestive enzyme plays a very crucial role here where the absorption of protein is maximized as much as possible. So this was the third very, very important point that I, I usually check in my protein supplements or where, whichever I prescribe. And the foremost very important is PDCAS score one. That is nothing but it signifies that the protein supplement that I am prescribing my patient has all the amino acids in their effective dosage. So I understand there are many products that will claim a lot of amino acid numbers are all written. We don't know what is that. So we feel okay to get, you know, have it, consume it. But the important factor here is to see, I don't need to see those numbers. I just need to know whether it's PDCAS1. So that proves that it's that all amino acids are present, the absorption is going to be good. Whenever the, it's an incomplete profile, the absorption is poor. So PDCAS score gives me that checkpoint to see whether that protein supplement is a good one for me to prescribe. So overall, I just like to highlight that somewhere we are lacking in our perception or somewhere we don't take protein as a very serious role player, but there is so much of literature running around protein. And we still see the deficiencies prevalent in spite of availability, awareness, and knowledge for this age. So somewhere, I just like to conclude by saying that let us step forward and bridge this gap, this protein gap, by making it as, as a serious choice and make sure that, you know, how, how can we support our patients with the same? Thank you very much. So very important point which is made here that by merely just adhering to the normal norms of protein, it should be part of our diet. 
that will make a trick and that's the most how to choose a protein product in the market. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, any questions for her? Anything? Yes, please. Uh, take, take, Monica. So, it's amino acids are essential. This would be insufficient quantity out of nine essential. Any, any, any particular thing more important than others? No. So, in general, body requires four twenty amino acids, of which nine are not, are, are essential, which you need to consume via food. So, we need all amino acids because the master uptake of amino acids for be for all. For all. And the more all present, the more the uptake is better. If there is deficient increase of the amino acids, the uptake and the higher availability, the software is going to be much lesser. So my recommendation would be to see this like I said, it has for one that any even if it's for muscle building, the amino acid profile has to be complete or a complete absorption. Uh, madam, I wanted to know what do you describe? There are so many protein brands available in the market. Vegetarian because they don't have an option. So the ratio is like 30 gram of that pulse will give me 
only 7 grams protein and 17 grams carbs. So today I want my patient to meet the protein requirement. I don't want my patient to consume carbs because carbs to acidity on charcoal work cycle layer. So I want to make sure that the patient is consuming pure carbs, protein. So that's why skin chana becomes as my snack and definitely it will be prescribed. And we have those plant protein coming out from there, from peas and brown rice and all of those. So that is happy. But the ratio of carbs is very high. So now I will not achieve what I want to achieve. Again, the question is, am I meeting my daily protein requirement? And when I count those numbers, I don't achieve them in a complete single chana. Definitely not. Okay. Yeah. But they will be still for short, somewhere or the other. And I am talking about all those health conscious uh, individuals, consumers, you, me, everyone, no, no, I eat cereals and I am eating a diet. There is no harm about that. I guess if all those, a big chunk of our patients who are not the protein requirement, they need there, there are so many wonders things that they can sort before they go into chemical therapy. Before a drug, in, 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 before that, I can solve it. Now, my patient, like I shared, she has so much muscle age. She's, she would have been consuming 10 years throughout her life. But by mere including protein supplements as your lifestyle, I could help that patient achieve all of that without having a drug. So, and that only because the patient was consuming less protein, not that it was a, they were able to have. So, the moral of the story here is that uh, we need to have enough protein in our diet. The way in which the newer life, the newer people, the young generation want to consume, and they come to us. As practitioner with a package, that is it a good package for me, or it has been prescribed by my trainer or by somebody else, my friend, by my neighbor. So you know the the best part of obesity and diabetes is what you know, right from your security guard to your driver to your uh, house house help, everyone can advise you on obesity and diabetes. So that makes it very complex. So you nicely said that what are the checkpoints, etc. And we will definitely look into it. Thank you very much, Dr. Tumika. And so next we are going to the most important thing that uh, the mental makeup of a person who is obese. Now, obesity is more of a lifestyle problem. It has been for centuries and millions of centuries obesity has remained. It has got definite basis in our mind. So apart from genetics, apart from our diet and lifestyle, apart from everything, the mental makeup and the thinking and the, the, the mental uh, physiology and the pathology of a person plays a great role in effect and cause of obesity. So today we have Ms. Tara Mehta here, a very pleasant uh, so clinical psychologist with MA and MPhil in clinical psychology. And she works in the Department of Mental Health and Behavioral Sciences at Fortis Hospital. She has experienced working with a wide range of psychological disorders and interacts closely with school across Mumbai. She's involved with corporates to help reduce stress and increase efficiency at workplace. And she's going to discuss the relationship of mental background with the obesity. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about obesity and mental health. I know we're uh, trying to uh, deal with obesity as um, in a more holistic fashion. And uh, all of us have seen an increase in the number of obese patients coming to all of us. Uh, so have we in the scope of mental health. More and more patients that we see, of course, have core psychiatric problems. But when it comes to mental health, there's no denying that regardless of the illness that you are treating, there are always some secondary mental health concerns that are now coming up and need to be treated for the beneficial aspect of the primary health concern that the patient has come with. So here, when we talk about obesity and mental health, it's a very 
correlated illness. So there's obesity, which leads to mental health illnesses, and there are mental illnesses which tend to aggravate the illness of obesity. And I'm going to start off with discussing a case uh, very briefly to give you an idea of how, as mental health professionals, we would take um, a patient with primary diagnosis of obesity with secondary diagnosis of a mental illness and how we would treat them if they came to us. So patient X is a 30-year-old single female, educated, uh, weighing about 150 kilos, suffers, of course, from diabetes and arthritis. Uh, the complaints that they came to me with were sad mood, crying spells, negative ruminations, palpitations, lack of interest in daily activities for the past one month. Now, these are very common complaints that we notice, and I'm sure you all as well, for different illnesses. But here what happened is the patient was friendly, cooperative. As we do a mental status examination, eye contact was maintained, patient was obese, but was dressed appropriately, and rapport was easily established. Um, the rapport being established is very important because as mental health professionals, uh, it's very important for us to be able to get the patient to open up to us with their personal problems. And when it is easily established, it also allows us an opportunity to realize the patient wants to work on their illness. Uh, the rate of speech was slow and hesitant, uh, volume was soft, mood was reported to be depressed, and so was the affect when they came to us. There were crying spells even in the session. There were no perceptual disturbances, the thoughts were relevant, coherent, but there were thoughts of hopelessness present. Um, there were no delusions, attention, concentration, and judgment was fine, and there was a diagnosis of depression that was made. So when we talk about obesity and depression, one thing that I would like to say is that when we talk about a patient being obese, having extra weight on them, there is that extra weight has come cumulatively over several years. There is a direct impact on their self-esteem, self-confidence, mental makeup that plays a huge role in the development of a mental illness, especially things like depression, anxiety, more on the neurotic spectrum. So we'll see, for example, when they have a low self-esteem, low self-confidence, there is a direct correlation to having sad mood, crying spells. They're having either eating too much or eating too little, having sleep disturbances. There is low energy levels. And as a result, there is low physical activity. There is hopelessness, there's suicidal ideation. And that itself results in extra weight, which again, worsens the obesity element of the disease. Now, how does obesity cause mental health? So when we break it down and we speak about obesity, what are the different aspects that one needs to look at? So for example, of course, there is some element of an eating disorder there. Either you are binge eating, you're eating too often, you're eating unhealthy things. And as a chronic disease, there's already dealing with sleep problems. The minute there are sleep problems, you're going to have problems in your mood and you're going to have problems with weight regulation. Because of the extra weight, there's constant body aches and pains. Some amount of that is because of the extra weight, some amount of it becomes somatic. So we're dealing with more a somatic element as well to the illness. There's reduced physical activity. So much of side effects are medication. Uh, very often even psychiatric medication leads to extra weight gain. So again, if they have a secondary psychiatric problem, which uh, the treatment of which requires a medication which leads to weight gain is going to worsen their symptoms of obesity. Uh, there's, of course, low self-esteem. There's also a poor perception of, I can't get better. No matter how much I try, I'm not able to lose my weight. There's no motivation to try and follow treatment protocol. There's no motivation to try and come in for therapy or listen to anybody or to be able to push yourself. And the worst is that there is so much social stigma in any case related to everything mental health. But even when it comes to things like being obese, the way you perceive yourself, the fact that you don't think you're good enough at what you do, the way others perceive you, the way society perceives you, the biases that society has with people who are overweight, the fact that when, especially when you talk about children, um, obesity in children in childhood is a very, um, it, it requires a lot of attention because there is so much of bullying that happens in school for any child who is overweight. There is cyber bullying. The digital media plays such an important role to tell you that this is a particular size and shape you should be. And if you don't fall into that bracket, uh, you know you're not good enough or you don't meet the criteria for what is approved by society. So social media, society plays such an important role when it comes to somebody looking a particular way that that's going to have an impact on mental health. 
And when we talk about mental health disorders, which cause obesity for people who have an unhealthy lifestyle, who use food as a coping mechanism. I'm feeling sad today, let me have a tub of ice cream. I'm angry today, let me have use food, let me use alcohol. Yes, let me use something um, to eat or drink, which call, immediately changes my mood. There is so much of instant gratification. Let me go to suddenly shop for something and then I'll feel better. There is so much of instant gratification to make us feel better that when it ends up being food related, it's going to, again, help you put on weight. It helps you not stay on track on your weight loss programs. Uh, I already mentioned medication having side effects. And because there is, you, you feel that you're not able to stick to protocols after a point in time, the family stops also you know, encouraging you to keep at it as do friends. And it becomes a vicious loop that patients get stuck in. Now, individuals with mental illness have a two or threefold increase in developing obesity. And while individuals who are obese have almost a 30 to 70% chance or risk of developing mental illnesses. Now, what are those mental illnesses that we are commonly going to see? Uh, which one of them would be mood disorders. So depression and bipolar both have um, by their general characteristics, affect energy levels, sleep is affected, appetite is affected, and the overall compliance to what is being treated as a primary illness is affected. Uh, over here, there's a high chance, there's almost a 2 or 3% a risk chance of developing obesity simply because you're too depressed, you're too low, your mind does not cooperate with you, you're not able to push yourself to stick to anything, to follow a particular treatment plan. So mood disorders are one of the most commonly associated psychiatric problems that we deal with when we see obese patients. Um, the next is anxiety, so panic, or having generalized anxiety. Having patients will come and say, Mujhe hoti hai, nahi hoti hai, man nahi lagta hai, kuch karne ka man nahi karta hai. So the entire aspect of anxiety, okay, let, I'll feel better if I just eat something right now. So again, using food to cope with anxiety symptoms is something also that we see very common. Personality disorders. Now, because one has had such a lot of exposure to low self-esteem, to low self-confidence, to not having the support of, let's say, family or society, there is going to be some amount of personality disorders that we end up working with. So dependent, avoidant personality disorders being the most common ones since we have the 10. Uh, so again, not wanting to do anything, poor decision-making, poor problem-solving, wanting everybody else to make the decisions for you. They're very common. And these, I imagine, one is, of course, related directly to obesity. But having these personality disorders as adults for the rest of your life and other aspects of your life leads to so many other problems that I'm then dealing with, relationship problems, marital problems. So it all becomes a very catch-22 situation because it affects, it has a wide range. And of course, we have eating disorders. So binge eating is something that's very, very common, as is PTSD. So literally 60% of women and 33% of men who are obese have expressed PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder as being a very relevant factor which maintains their illness of obesity. And because PTSD results in, again, using food as a poor coping method, or it uses food as a way of dealing with your emotions. It will use it as a reward system for yourself whenever you're dealing with something traumatic, leads to disturbances of dopamine and serotonin in your brain. And that itself, again, leads to mood disturbances and causes a whole vicious cycle all over again. Now, I'm very briefly going to touch base on what it is that we do in psychotherapy. So there are different modes of treating patients with mental health illnesses with obesity. Psychotherapy is initially the most preferred way because, again, we want to limit the amount of medication given, uh, again, because of the side effects of either weight gain or drowsiness, which, again, leads them to not being able to be socially active enough to 
help with the weight loss. So CBD is works very well, especially for mood disorders and for eating disorders. The main element here is to help change their relationship with food, is to help change their thought process in realizing that the thoughts are connected to the way you feel and your emotions are connected to the way that you behave. So for majority patients will come to me and say, I don't like the way I feel, or I don't like the way that I am acting in a particular situation. So I feel anger, which I have a problem with, and I uh, throw things and I break things and my behavior of anger is what I have a problem with. Uh, but ultimately it's for us to help them realize that your emotions and the behavior all stems from your thought process. So if you think happy, you feel happy. If you think angry, you feel angry. So it all boils down to you working on the thought process, realizing what are the errors in your thought process, changing to a better, more adaptive way of thinking, which will help change the way you feel and behave. It doesn't mean you go down to zero because all emotions are normal to experience. But as long as you are controlling your emotions and your emotions are not controlling you, that's the primary factor that we focus on. There's always mindfulness, which is uh, what we do, which is the newer um, psychotherapies, which are done, which helps in stress reduction, live in the moment. Don't focus so much on what's happened in the past or all the stressors in the future. What can you do right now in this moment to help yourself? So a lot of anxiety and stress management as well. Um, then we do DBT, which focuses on introducing affect regulation. So very often somebody will come and say, no, I'm sad, but I was perfectly fine when one minute and I'm crying the next minute. Nothing goes from zero to 10 immediately. Neither does your anger, neither does your happiness, neither does hunger. So when we talk about introducing affect regulation, because here it's about regulating your emotions. It's not, so I'm fine, I'm happy, let's say on a scale of zero to 10, zero. 10 being that I'm extremely unhappy, sad, crying, suicidal. Nobody goes from zero to 10 immediately. So learn to identify what is the point till which you have control and what point beyond which you have lost control. So maybe uh, till the time that I'm three or four or five on the scale, I can still control myself. But maybe beyond five or beyond six, I'm so sad or so upset that I no longer have control over the way that I feel. Let's help you identify what are those symptoms for zero, one, two, three, four, five. What can we do to help anxiety management so that you can control yourself before you reach that point of no return. So being able to identify affect regulation, how to regulate the way you feel. Is it just about changing the way you think at that moment? Is it about doing like a breathing exercise or a relaxation exercise of the muscles to help reduce anxiety and panic at that moment? What can be done in that moment to help you so that you have the correct coping skills and you don't reach a point where the emotions are controlling you? We have interpersonal therapy because there's going to be so much of social deficit in the way a person has no longer interacting with the environment, with society, the way they should because of all the bias and the low self-esteem. So interpersonal therapy becomes very, very important to make them functional human beings in society. One is to treat their illness. One is also to make them functional human beings back in society because that's what keeps, that's the long-term game that therapy plays. Uh, increasing motivation. Focus on reducing ambivalence. Very often it is, I'm not sure I want surgery. I'm not sure I want to follow a diet. I'm not sure I should be doing this. To help them with that ambivalent mindset, because again, when you're avoidant and dependent, you tend to not be able to make judgments which are appropriate for you. So to help them deal with this ambivalence, to help them be on track with their treatment plan is something we work with and self-management. Because the ultimate goal is therapy is not for the patient to be dependent on the therapist, but how to reach you to a point where you are managing yourself with the necessary skill that is required. Um, that is largely what we do when we talk about mental health and basically it's a short overview. Any questions from, uh, yeah, please. So, when Dr. Charlie was talking about the hormones, he has not mentioned about the few hormones which she has spoken to. It was also part of obesity management. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in your clinical practice, what percentage of obese patients have a mental case, mental problem? And let's put it the other way. What cases of mental cases are obese? As you said in one of the slides, they are vice versa. Right. In your clinical practice, right. what is the percentage? 80% of obese patients will have mental health problems. 
of various levels. I'm not saying everybody is going to have depression or anxiety or a personality factor, but they are natural byproducts. It all depends, again, how quickly you catch it. If it's a child, for example, right, we may have mild anxiety, we might not have a personality disorder. But if it is diagnosed at an adult stage, you're going to have, let's say, mild to moderate depression with far more personality factors. So it depends upon, again, when it is diagnosed, how early it's diagnosed. But 80% of patients will have some psychological factors, maybe not psychiatric illnesses, but psychological factors which need to be addressed. Wherein um, probably 50%, 40-50% of mental uh, illness-based patients will have uh, an obesity element to them, especially more so I've seen recently in younger children. Hmm. Uh, I would say that the percentage is increasing. Again, I will say that you'll definitely see at least 20 to 30 percent for sure uh, on an average who definitely are obese. Uh, the percentages are increasing every day, especially with children. One patient of mine said, Psychiatric medicine also play a role in the way they can It does. There are psychiatric medications which, for which the unfortunate side effects are weight gain. Uh, psychiatrists do tend to not keep patients on them long term. Uh, the medicines work in some cases, and so they have to be put on them, especially, for example, if you are if you are dealing with a schizophrenia. Sometimes you just need antipsychotics, which do increase weight gain for a short amount of time, and then they're changed. But uh, those are unfortunate. Weight gain. And, and it's not as if they continuously gain. It will gain weight and then the body gets used to it and weight gain is not so substantial, but some amount of weight gain. Thank you. Uh, so we are coming to the main part of our today's talk. Now we have covered what is the hormonal background, what is the, so I mean, diet and nutrition. Then we are coming to the mental health, how how it plays the role in obesity. So today, the main our uh, speaker today is Dr. Kofi Lakrawala. He is going to discuss about obesity pandemic and how to fight this battle. He is the one who is going to give us an oral picture of how are we going to tackle the obesity. And he has taken it, obesity as a jihad, as a, you know, he has taken it uh, 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 fullest to the extent. And I will request him to uh, come on the dais. Dr. Lakhrawala popularity, popularly known as Dr. Mufi, is India's best known laparoscopic surgeon. Specializing in bariatric and gastrointestinal surgeries, is the co-founder and chief surgeon at Digestive Health Institute and director of surgery, the Department of General and Minimal Access Surgical Sciences at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital Research Center, Mumbai. Over the last two decades, he has helped thousands of people get rid of obesity and obesity-related issues like diabetes. He has given a new lease of life to countless people where many of them found it difficult to even walk. They now run marathons, travel the world, and pursue their passions. In his 20-plus years of practice, he has won numerous awards and the best surgeon in the world award by American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in 2019. The World Master Educator Award by IFSO in 2019, and he has performed more than 50,000 plus life-saving surgeries in India and internationally. So we have Dr. Mufi Lakrawala for us today. May I welcome Dr. Lakrawala?
Thank you, sir. Uh, it's always a uh, pleasure to come back here and speak again. Uh, I think this is my second, third, maybe third or fourth uh, trip out of here. But uh, I'm speaking to you today about the overall general obesity pandemic. Nothing specific about bariatric surgery per se, because that you've heard uh, multiple number of times. I just wanted to highlight the big problem that we face. Uh, we, we were very scared of the pandemic that just has hit us. It's probably not yet over, but the COVID pandemic, everybody went up and down. We were locked away in our houses. But this silent pandemic, which has been creeping up across the world for, for centuries now, uh, none of us have really paid attention to it. So yesterday being the World Obesity Day, I thought it was most apt and appropriate when Dr. Metha asked me, but I'd love to get this program together. And I said, that's the best opportunity if there is any. Now, so I'll speak to you about the economic impact of overweight and obesity. <clears throat> More than 4 trillion people since when, by 2035. And I think this will just get bigger because if you look at not only overweight obesity, but you add in the type two diabetes pandemic, this four trillion will become eight trillion. And that's just the amount of money that some of the governments across the world, if they are willing, and we know they're not willing, will have to spend just to control this pandemic. So we don't really have the money. We don't really have the resources. We don't even have the political might to try and or the people in the right space to think about obesity as a disease. At least in India, we, we doubt, doubt whether we'll take years to identify obesity as a disease. We're very happy identify cancer, diabetes, infertility, uh, sleep apnea, all as individual diseases. We don't want to treat the mothership of it all. That's obesity. We don't even want to make attempts at trying to prevent it. And that's the big problem. So this is just, if you see across how much money will be spent, the entire population of Asia at 2020 will be 412 billion. So if you look at America and we do understand that they do spend a lot of money, uh, it is around 870 billion. So uh, Gulf alone, which has got so much less of population compared to us, will be spending close to 70 billion uh, and we've already crossed this. So just look at the, the numbers jumping up. It's almost 100 times in 30 years. And that's that's a, a, a very, very difficult cost to manage. Let's go back into why we've become obese over the period of time, right? So from the Pima Indians, right? What happened is when they were migrating, their resting metabolic rates went down because they became from hunters to gatherers. They became from uh, eating animals to planting and uh, having civilizations around them. So they didn't have to travel for their uh, daily living. And that's how obesity and cardiovascular diseases went up in the Pima Indians. In terms of the climate, the hot and cold climate and how we adapted to it. If you look at the Canadian Inuits, okay, they had to travel because of the climatic changes. And that's where their resting metabolic rates went up. Their obesity and cardiovascular diseases came back. The same thing with the uh, aborigines, where in, just like the Pima Indians, they stopped traveling too much. They were curtailed into a smaller space by the growing industrialization of Australia, you could say. And that's where the resting metabolic rate came down. Obesity and cardiovascular disease went up. The young guns were just like the Canadian in Inuits. Their resting metabolic rates went up and that's how. So it's all to do with as simple as your resting metabolic rate. <clears throat> so I'll just look at this uh, genetic changes that's happened in us. And we look at the metagenetics of the whole population in per se. Between 1960 to around 1990, we were okay. We were doing all right. Just within, uh, uh, the last 20 years, you can say, it takes somewhere between 184 to 1840 generations of natural selection. So 5,300 to 53,000 years for a human population to undergo meaningful genetic change. But obesity rates have nearly tripled in just few generations. The rise probably has more to do with our changes in our lifestyle and environment. So as we become more and more comfortable with our air conditioners and our refrigerators and our escalators, and our cars, we must realize that we've completely transformed how genetic changes happen in our population. And that's why we keep talking about 
chana and zinc not being enough for our population when you need proteins or where tara has become a specialist whose help is needed by most of us in this room so that's where uh, you your dr firuza saying about how we never really needed to worry about delivering kids but today we need to do various various things to deliver our kids and that's how this has happened all right so the basis is behind this if you look at just india in numbers okay one out of every four persons is obese today in india and these are statistics from the national fab, uh, family health survey okay uh, the obesity among the rich is far more higher okay so we do know that it is a disease of the rich in india it's a disease of the poor in america because of the food patterns so we we love to call our kids pleasantly plump we never admonish them for putting on weight in childhood and that's the time when we really need to act on them in terms of uh, the percentage children under 5 79% are overweight i think more than obese they are overweight because under 5 years if they are obese there is probably monogenic obesity and that's not necessarily their fault the rest is khate pite ghar ka hai and that's when they put on weight if you look at the uh, low income group if you look at the middle income group again 73% 71% in the high income so if you look at the just the split up amongst the the years you will realize that the middle income group probably is the only one which does well for children between 5 to 19 because they they the parents maybe the mothers are very very careful of what their ch- children eat in school and they are very cognizant of that whereas in the adults once it becomes that then the middle income group is the hardest working group and, and that's why their their po- population comes down but if you look at in terms of numbers you will just see that how this changes Now I just want to play this uh, the number of deaths by risk in the world. All right, just see how it changes. High blood pressure, smoking, air pollution, high blood sugar rank amongst the top three. Obesity, you see, it's it rising. It's now number four over the years. High blood sugar, high blood pressure are causes secondary to obesity. So if you take the top Two, besides air pollution, of course, secondly, uh, you will realize how soon we are in the top three or four brackets that are all because of obesity. The number of deaths we never really attributed that to an obese person dying. We always say heart attack se mara ya, cancer se mara ya, uh, diabetes se mara. We never say that. So if you look at an obesogenic environment, what we must realize is that our genes as Indians and Asians. other guns okay our genes are loaded we have a gun when we are born it's what we do with ourselves do we want to fire the trigger with our environment and our lifestyle changes once you pull the trigger there's no looking back so it better be we love to blame our parents we love to say my mom dad both were diabetic that's why i have to become diabetic so you are not even repentant of the fact that you put on that extra 20 kilos and that's why you become that if you want to But all that twenty kilos, you probably will not follow your parents. You might not, or you might delay the onset of type two diabetes. So all these political, social, cultural, economic, ecological, all technological things, as we get more and more from playing outdoor games into iPads and various other things, that can all result to the pandemic. And uh, the the reason why I've shown you this because majority of the obesity in India is between twenty five to thirty five BMI, and that's where the type two diabetes comes in. We are number one in the world today in terms of type two diabetes. We beat in China. Uh, we are also number three in the world in terms of obesity after US and China. Now, government policies. Do you think a fat tax can help us? Niti uh, Aayog is signing the proposal of taxing foods high in sugar. Do you think all these things can help us? Well, all governments have tried various things, and I think we need a bit of government help. Not just we need central government help. we just we need a direction towards more open spaces so if you were to town planning if you don't have an open space uh, we we all plan for parking lots we never plan for open spaces and that's where uh, the big problem is now sugar sweetened beverage tax around the world if you look at all these various countries all proposals have been there but it's only in malaysia that the uh, thing has been passed actually by the government 
various other places, they've all proposed that various taxes should be put onto sugar foods and it should be built higher for that. Uh, the countries are mandatory or voluntary front package labels. So this is all coming from the government side, all right? So all these various countries, if you look at United Kingdom that's, and Europe, that's probably been the leaders in terms of taxing people and putting it out on those labels that you need to do. But even things like Iran, for example, has all these labels out over there. Uh, I think we are lacking. We need to get there in terms of uh, quite often, I don't know how many people stay in Bandra because this is more sea ward, but see, there is a place where you get, <laughs> Tara's laughing, you get uh, a diet chivra and you look at the package, it's full of oil. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how they calculate the calories. I'm from where they've calculated the calories. Probably they calculate the calories in their mind and they just put the same chivra and package. And that's the big problem that we don't have a government body that regulates this and actually looks at it being passed. Now, Australia has taken a huge initiative in terms of uh, trying to tackle the obesity population in their, this thing. So they have created supportive, sustainable and healthy environment from the government side, empowering people to stay healthy. So they, the corporates, the government per se, actually uh, benefits people who continue to stay healthy Access to early intervention care is provided by the government. The government pays their GPs money to actually look after these patients. So every GP visit, the GP is paid to make sure his patient or his uh, whoever's coming to him. So the actual uh, general practitioners actually look after a continuum of care in Australia. And that's why the model seems to be working very well. I think in India, if we had a generalized uh, concept of that kind, I think it will work because most general practitioners actually are the closest to their patients. So, you know, I did a, a survey recently with Novo Nordis, wherein they interviewed 3,000 people with uh, obesity. Uh, it's an action in uh, APAC study, Asia Pacific Action Study for Obesity. And they interviewed 300 uh, doctors who were into clinical practice for more than 10 years. And you saw at least 10 obese people on a day. And you will be shocked with the results as well. They published recently, it will come in the newspapers and all, that the number of people who, amongst the healthcare professionals who were totally uh, ignorant of the available options today for obesity was just sharp, sharply. Forget uh, bariatric surgery. They didn't even know which drugs were managed. They always, the, the concept that came out was, it is the problem of the patient. The patient thought, if I just diet and exercise a little bit, even if I was 200 kilos, I would definitely lose the weight. The family members all thought that it was the patient's fault that he was obese. It was not anything to do with recognizing obesity as a disease. So once that study gets published, I'm going to encourage no one to distribute it because that could be a mindset change that we need to do. If we get out of the mindset change, then a lot of things would move probably from there. Now, Europe. Europe had the EPOD initiative. Let's get together to prevent childhood obesity. I think we need something like this in India because today our uh, children and our adolescents, like Tara showed you, not only really suffer from obesity, but because of that, they come with scars of mental health, uh, which continue into the schools. And it's very difficult to control children in, between the age of five to 12. How are you going to regulate another child shouting or laughing at a kid who's obese? That becomes very difficult. So we need to get into things. Controlling sales of foods in public institutions and in schools especially. So anything which is sugar, fat laden should be banned in a school so that they don't read option, get that option. We should have uh, uh, you know, people like Bobika speaking at schools on a regular basis rather than having doctors there to teach them what is good food, what is bad food and various other things. Mental health... Uh, the talks by uh, Tara and her lot who can actually tell kids that at least if you put it in their mind, they will go back and tell their parents this is healthy, this is unhealthy. I remember once doing a live uh, Facebook and uh, my son was five years old and uh, I was giving this whole talk against sugar on the Facebook live and he came down the stairs and he shouted and said, sugar is bad, chocolates are bad. That's just because we taught him that. And it was not prompted or anything. It was live on Facebook and it was a quite a hilarious moment. Though right now I think he does eat a little bit of chocolate, frankly. So that's the exposure that they do get. 
uh, we need to train healthcare professionals into understanding these aspects. So in terms of interventions to reduce uh, obesity in the United Kingdom, well, they followed portion control, uh, reformulation of the food products. So the government is putting in that kind of thing. Availability of high calorie foods and beverages are being uh, taxed and uh, paid much higher. Parental education, weight management programs, uh, school curriculum includes these healthy meals and eventually various other things. So obesity uh, is not just about calories in and calories out. And the moment we recognize that, we'll stop admonishing someone with weight problem. Okay. How many of y'all has tried to lose five kilos and maintain that over a period of time as a show of hands? One, two, three. <laughs> so one, two, three. Huh? You're not alone. <laughs> one, two, three. So just imagine the rest of us sitting in this can't manage to lose five kilos and maintain it. Losing weight is not, not difficult. Maintain it so over a period of two, three, four years and everywhere. Uh, that was coming up. <laughs> but that's the big problem, that it is, it, is, it is a maintenance issue, whatever we do. And that is why, just imagine someone who's put on 50 kilos, 100 kilos. How is it ever going to be possible for them to maintain that without proper guidance and medical help? Yeah, so the family needs to understand this, the individuals need to understand this, healthcare professionals like us need to understand this. Obesity is complicated, it's lifelong, it's chronic, and that's why WHO identifies this as a chronic disease with, which is uh, life threatening. Yeah, that's the definition of WHO for obesity. Like I said, kids below the age of five, it could be monogenic obesity, don't blame them if their weight is. 50, 60 kilos, they are not pleasantly plump, they're sick. So treat them. We've got now uh, various genetic tests. We've got at least 160 uh, genetic uh, factors that have been identified to identify monogenic obesity from the mutations in the left genes, the left PR genes, the POMC genes, the PSI genes, and the MC4R. We've got drugs now targeting the POMC and MC4R, which are in uh, the stages of evolution. So any kid who's like 50, 60 kilos and under five years of age doesn't need surgery. And I'm, I speak against this. I speak properly against even my, my friends and colleagues who actually feel very proud of operating on a young kid. I am against this, right? Because eventually they will put on weight because the problem is not with what they take and the problem is here. And so that needs to be tackled. And then, of course, we spoke about the genes and the pulling the trigger, the polygenic obesity, which happens with Menarche and adolescent, and then goes on from there on. So the chemical factors, physical factors, and biological factors all contribute to it. There's a lot being spoken about microbiota and its change in today's changing eating and food lifestyle behavior that can all lead to management of obesity. So if you look at the middle part, and you add individual biologically and behavior. So you take an Indian and put him in America, right? So his genes can travel with him, his prenatal environment has traveled with him, his diet may change, physical activity may change, the stress may change, and sleep patterns may change. But the first two he carries with him, microbiome might change. Uh, occupation, again, things that we can control. Socioeconomic environment, again, can be controlled. Culture and community can be controlled. It's individual attitudes towards dietary attitudes, preferences, uh, medical compliance and concepts. So though you take Indians out, certain things he carries with him, certain things he adapts. So it's a polygenic, obesogenic environment which can change everything. These are the kind of cutoffs that all of y'all are aware of. We have special categories for Asians and Indians where WHO has recommended that you drop the BMI by 2.5 points because our diabetes and central obesity come with a much lower BMI. And so we don't really have to follow the American uh, Caucasian population in that. This from head to toe is what I want y'all to know, that every obese individual will have one of these by the time he uh, goes through his lifespan. Right from the top, we, we heard Tara speak about depression, binge eating disorders, night eating syndromes, uh, headaches, obesity-related cardiomyopathy, right side and left side heart failures, uh, then uh, respiratory dysfunction. So you have the sleep apneas, asthma getting much worse because of the gastroesophageal 
the flux disease. Then, of course, the big guys, the metabolic syndrome. Uh, it is a combination of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, high cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, LDL. Most of us genetically have a high LDL. If you have a high triglycerides, high cholesterol, along with an LDL, need to worry because your HDL is always going to remain low. Uh, NASH, most underdiagnosed disease. We are all very happy when looking at the ultrasound reports that says grade one fatty liver, grade two fatty liver. We never really associated uh, NAFLD or non alcoholic fatty liver disease going into NASH and getting worse from there. Osteoarthritis, of course, indeed comes with age, but also comes with weight and becomes worse. The other form of uh, arthritis, which is gouty arthritis, we never speak about. But it's a direct link between fatty liver, hypertension, and high uric acid levels. Uh, endocrine dysfunctions, we did speak. Most people who even sit in the sun for 24 hours, if that is possible, will still have vitamin, hypovitaminidosis D if they're obese. I hope you understand that. Uh, the hormones, we had uh, David speak about it, Mam will speak about it further. But one thing I want you to go home with that cancers has a direct link today to obesity. There's a 24% higher chance of developing uh, a breast cancer or uh, ovarian cancer if you're a woman who's been struggling with obesity for a very long period of time. There's a 19% higher risk of developing a prostate cancer or a, a pancreatic or colorectal cancer in males if you've been obese for a long time. These are CDC guidelines that have just been published around two years back. So now we must understand that if someone's had bariatric surgery, picked up a cancer after two years, it's not the surgery. It's just that the obesity has made him drive him through the cancer. It's been picked up now. Now, these complications I already spoke to you about, various, various percentages of complications that an obese person can have. And how do we tackle this? So what kind of weight loss is enough to tackle this? A 0 to 5% total body weight loss is good enough to tackle or decrease medications for hypertension. And your hyperglycemia, your fasting glucose can come down or your HPA1C can get controlled with just 5% total body weight loss, all right? Uh, if you have five to 10% total body weight loss, then your diabetes could be prevented if you've not got it in your pre-diabetic. Uh, your fatty liver can get better. You'll remain at grade one and won't go to grade two, grade three. PCOS, I will tell you further about it, but can get controlled if you lose that weight and you might actually go on to become pregnant just with that 5 to 10% of total body weight loss. Dyslipidemia, your cholesterol, triglycerides will get better. What happens between 10 to 15%? Cardiovascular disease comes down, risk comes down, sleep apnea goes away, GRD comes down, osteoarthritis comes down, NASH, which is NFLD, we move to NASH, that will come down. And uh, urinary stress incontinence, SUI, will come down. So this is where the drugs are tackling, all right? Every drug was first approved, including Olistat, which most of us would have used at some point of time because it gave up to 5% total body weight loss. Every drug, what has changed, like David said, semaglutide, terzipatide has changed the fulcrum. It gives between 15% and above. Terzipatide, they are saying in certain cases, gives up to 21%. Uh, semaglutide is known to give between 15 to 17% total body weight loss at long term. More than 15% is type 2 diabetes remission, cardiovascular mortality decreasing, and overall improvement in quality of life. What does surgery give you? Any surgery you do, irrespective of what, will give you a minimum of 25 to 30% total body weight loss. All right. So that's where our drugs lie between now, the good drugs. It's not available in India yet. Only ribosys is available. That gives you around that uh, 5 to 10 percent of total body weight loss. But the injectable ones, the Ozempics, the Bimovis, and the, the more Punjaros, which are not yet available in India, will give you 15 percent above up to 20 percent. So we are still there. We still have not reached the levels of surgery. Management of obesity, well, lifestyle changes, uh, pharmacotherapy, not getting into technical details. The guidelines of surgery, we all do know, you have to be around 32.5 with diabetes or 35 and above to consider bariatric surgery. Now, if you look at this chart of a, an average male or female with weight, what happens is you lose weight. Everybody loses weight. And then you see the maintenance is the problem. 
Uh, with just lifestyle, behavioral treatment, it happens earlier. Surgery also, you tend to regain weight. Your average set point is dropped a lot more than what happens on this treatment. Keep going up. With the standard form of therapy, some of the combination form of therapy, they expect that this curve will shift from here and come closer to this line. And you need this line uh, and below to get uh, healthier. Well, this I think has been covered. Various diets have been tried from Atkins to South Beach. Every actor or every famous person covers one type of diet and we all believe it works for us. Doesn't necessarily, we are different human beings. We look different, we behave different. So not necessarily that every diet will necessarily work for us. Uh, this is the macronutrient diet. I think she's covered that, so I won't get too much. But it, once you calculate, and today a lot of these machines can calculate your uh, resting energy expenditure, your REP. Once you calculate that, you should go at least 500 kilocalories less than your resting energy expenditure to lose any significant amount of weight. So it's very easy today. We don't really need to get into more complicated formulas. So I would recommend that if you have an obese person, please ask him for his REP. It can be done anywhere. And then once you plan that, then uh, you can look at all these ways. Physical activity, they say 10,000 steps. That's the a AD, ADA as well as AHA guidelines. Uh, a lot of us have smartwatches today. We all wear them. It can help as well. Uh, lifestyle modifications, pharmacological management of obesity, again, uh, too complicated to get into. Most anti-obesity drugs, like I told you, diet, exercise, all go on the top. This is where it's changed with the SEMA group diet. Uh, and bariatric surgery, which is coming there. Uh, the balloon, swallowable balloon, you all have heard of it. It's popular because you walk in, you swallow something like a capsule, and suddenly you wake up, you know, it's just not so simple. You have a lot of vomiting in the first week. Some of these people actually want to go out and sue me because they had vomiting, despite me telling them that they've had, they're going to get struggled for the first week. Everyone thinks how much ever we tell them it's going to be difficult. It is difficult. Uh, it takes four to five days to a week sometimes. It settles down because your body adjusts to it. It falls off on its own after another four-week period. At best, you'll get around 10 to 15 kilo weight loss, depending on how obese you are. So it's a pre-marriage balloon. It's good enough if you want to lose some weight without having to work hard at it. But if you want to look at managing obesity, well, this is not the answer that you should be looking at. Right? There are various other endoscopic options from the endoscopic stitching of your stomach. Now, with the new drugs, the combination gives you around that 15% total body weight loss. So either use the drugs or you do an endoscopic uh, sleeve to begin with, gets you that 10, 15 kilos, and then again, go ahead and do something. There is even aspiasis, which has been approved by FDA in the US. People eat a lot of food, then they go to the bathroom, then they give a lavash to their stomach, open up like a tap, feeding bag out over here and bring out all the food that they've taken. So they feel mentally that they've eaten this food and then they just go out and instead of vomiting it out, they just go out and wash their stomach and bring it out. So this is a, approved by FDA. These are various types of bariatric surgery, not the right time and place to discuss this, but we all do know that the safety of bariatric surgery today is as much as getting a gallbladder or a hysterectomy done. So don't worry about the safety aspects. Even if you're a 200 kg patient, uh, next week, there's a 99% chance you'll walk home without any problem. The surgery takes an hour or so to do. We do around an average of three to four on a daily basis at HN. And if you think your patient needs it, especially if their diabetes is getting worsened, despite going to the best endocrinologist, if you've gone to Dr. Pirza Parik and still not had your infertility issues sorted, or if you think your mental health is worsening because of obesity, then please look at bariatric surgery. Uh, it might give you that, that ray of hope uh, in the darkness that we are looking at. This eventually, I just want you to end with this. This is the half scale of trying to lose weight eventually. Uh, diet and exercises comes as your first option. Diet exercises with psychological monitoring uh, and weight loss medications comes as two. Then comes the balloon and various other things. All this knowledge. So diet and exercise and psychological monitoring comes as a part and parcel of everything, right? From just plain that to eventually getting the surgery done, 
and that. So the hop scale needs diet, exercise, and psychological monitoring as part of it. And that's why our team includes people like Urbika, people like uh, Tara, and everybody else. It's a, you can't do this alone. You need a multidisciplinary team to manage any obese person because it's a chronic disease. Think of it like a cancer model. Just a cancer surgeon doesn't work. You need a medical oncologist, you need a radiotherapist, and everybody else to, to give the best results. Eventually, the idea is to get to precision medicine. Think of it as evidence-based medicine, as AI tools go better and better precision medicine. We get epigenetic patterns, we get genetic makeups, we see the environment interactions, all that will play. And we we will walk into my clinic and put a button on some computer someday, hopefully, and say, okay, you need 20 grams of proteins, you need this much of carbohydrates, you need two sessions with Tara, you need this surgery from me, and voila, after one year, you lose that weight and you maintain it for the rest of the year. But you're still far away from this. Okay, the challenge still remains. Let's run up to them, let's do a diet until then, and let's hope and prevent whatever you can do. I do that. I would recommend that you recommend your patients to do that. The moment I get one tighter on my belt, I start doing various things to prevent that belt from getting one hole more on it. So do something. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Thank and then the overall overview of the entire community. So may I uh, just say questions for you? Yes. Calories come from carbohydrates, proteins, fats. All the extra calories are converted into fat, stored in the abdomen, butter. And keep pushing the hand. Now, when I make exercise, what do I exercise? My carbohydrates burn first, my fats don't burn at all. How do I burn my fats? Why are my, why are my carbohydrates burned first? Puddings burn first, I require extra pudding on the contrary. And fats are not burned at all. And you're telling your uh, text and sweet text and all, children who are always in school, they should be punished. They should have extra into activities by in the evening when I talk about cycling and playing basketball and whatever they say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for the, for the children, uh, you can ask all their mothers. They probably tax the mothers more than they get <laughs> about maintain that. But I think uh, what you said is quite correct. After a certain age, it becomes very difficult to lose the fat. Because any amount of fat, you would have realized between 20, 30, 40, 50 and above, what happened? You start putting on weight, doing the same things. You said that you managed to maintain your weight loss, so you've done miraculously well. So, um, what I would recommend is that consume carbohydrates when you're going to exercise. So they're combustible sources of energy because you need those carbohydrates. If you look at an athlete, he eats a banana or they drink something, it's only for that consumption. So that's why they say eat your breakfast like a king, eat your lunch like a noble and eat your dinner like a popper. We do it completely the other way around. Right? Uh, our dinners are the heaviest as Indians and that, that's when we go to sleep. Our body goes into resting period. But what I would recommend is so that older we become, we need protein. Because proteins, the amount of protein, if there are three compartments, one compartment is pushing for space more than the other. The, the lesser our proteins become muscle based down, breakdown happens as we go older. The fat component becomes bigger. The carbohydrate remains more or less there. It's the fat component which becomes bigger. So I think to put the fat component back in its place, take the proteins, it's more important after the age of 50 than actually before the age of 50. That's for more for athletes than before the age of 50. But after the age of 50, it's needed to keep your muscles in shape so that the fat behaves itself. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, it's an excellent treat today, and we are now coming to the last lecture of the day, uh, which is the uh, women's health and obesity. So it's going to be by Dr. Firoza Parekh. She's a
So, Dr. Finoza Pare, she is the director, Well Women Center, Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital. She is director, Chaslo uh, uh, Fertility International F uh, Fertility Center, editor in chief, Fertility and Sterility, uh, Indian Edition, editorial board member, Fertility and Sterility, USA, and Fertility and Sterility Sci Science, USA. Southeast Asia's first ICSI baby in 1994. 20,000 babies delivered by her team. Over 150 scientific publications and many book chapters in national and international journals. So we have Dr. Firoza Malik to discuss about the impact of obesity on a women's life, you know, and right from early adulthood to pregnancy to menopause and up. Thank you, Dr. Mufi, for inviting me. Thank you, Anil Bhai. It's a pleasure to be here on World Obesity Day. Before I actually start <clears throat> the talk, I want to tell you about one episode that happened in my clinic about a week ago. A couple who had had a baby with us six years ago came to see us with the baby. And of course, you know, he said, we are very happy, this, that. But I saw that the man was a little uncomfortable. So at the end of our conversation, I asked him, something is bothering you. So he said, yes, doctor, when I saw you six years ago, you're very healthy. I managed to lose about six, eight kilos in this five, six years. So that is the impression that people have, that if you are little plump, you're healthy and good. And if you've lost weight or you're thin, something is perhaps wrong. So I want to start with that notion. Dr. Mufi gave a very good talk and here, before I start, I want to drive home a point that today, obesity can be linked to our epigenetics. Now, what is epigenetics? In epigenetics, our DNA code doesn't change. The four main builders of DNA remain the same, but there are tags that get attached to our DNA, which doesn't change the genotype, but changes the phenotype. And the one thing that brings about these changes are the pollutants in our environment. The major pollutants are endocrine disrupting chemicals, which actually behave like estrogen receptors or sometimes anti-estrogens, and sometimes they behave like testosterone mimicking agents. So what endocrine disruptors in one sentence, if you want to know, may feminize the male and masculinize the female. That is why we see women today attaining early puberty, but also having early menopause. And we see men where there are many, many scientific studies, including our own, which have shown a significant decline in the sperm parameters. And there is a book that I would urge you to read by Shana Swan, where they have shown that there is a significant drop in semen parameters over time. And they've also shown that men who have low sperm counts and other sperm parameters are more prone to morbidity, mortality, and testicular cancer. So one of the common links, of course, is obesity and endocrine disrupting chemicals. Doc, we already know the importance of obesity and the incidence of obesity. Now, there is one book I would urge you all to read, which is Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. It not only talks about your lifespan, but it also talks about the health span. And it is by a PhD from Harvard. His name is David Sinclair. And many of the things which lead to obesity can be found in this book. I had a fantastic two-week reading with this book, which took me some time to read because 
There are lots of concepts that need to be understood. So I'd urge you to read this book by David Sinclair. David Sinclair, S-I-N-C-L-A-I-R-E, why we age and why we don't have to. He doesn't only talk about the lifespan, span, but he talks about the health span. So it's a very important reading material for all of us. Now we know, as Dr. Mufi said, that we are in a pandemic mode with obesity, particularly in India, where we see that diabetes occurs almost a decade earlier, and we see this all the time in our infertile couples. So we mandatorily do their, do their sugars and even the HbA1c in the first visit. And we find a surprising number of couples having either pre-diabetes, altered sugars, or even frank diabetes. So obese women we know are going to be more prone to develop many, many conditions in their reproductive system. We've all heard already about insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and hyperandrogenism. And here itself, I would like to tell you that there's a very strong link between obesity and cancer, particularly some of the female cancers. This shows you the mechanisms of infertility arising from obesity. Here, what happens in obese women, we see that the follicles undergo atresia and apoptosis very early. That is why when women come for IVF and they are obese, they require much higher doses of gonadotropins than somebody who is lean. It also causes changes in the endometrium. And therefore, older women, even when they produce good embryos, have difficulty in conceiving because the endometrium is not receptive. We all know the pre, the pro-inflammatory factors, leptin being the biggest culprit, and TNF-alpha, IL-6, all these will contribute to the obesity and the pro-inflammation with various uh, hormones and also with the <clears throat> other cytokines. So if you look at this chart in one flash, you will see that inflammation is the biggest contributor to obesity and its effects. And we know that obesity will affect many, many factors. It affects the sex steroids, increases estrogens and androgens. Obesity plays a role in hyperinsulinemia. Obesity and the ovary we'll talk about with PCOS. I already told you about obesity and the endometrium becoming non-receptive and the effects of obesity on IVF outcomes. This is all well established. The writing is very clear on the wall. And women who are obese tend to need more care during IVF. They tend to give poor quality eggs. The embryos will be more fragmented. They show more meiotic changes, more aneuploidies, and therefore lesser live birth rates. We will talk about polycystic ovary syndrome a little later. And here it is. When you have somebody who is, has polycystic ovaries, what are the hallmarks? Hyperandrogenism with facial hair, acne, obesity. Then you will see the nigricans line, acanthosis nigricans line. This is a very famous picture of the bearded lady with polycystic ovaries. Okay, and again, this just points out that the androgenism and the hyperinsulinemia contribute to this condition. We know that central obesity is seen more in women with PCOS. So if you want to remember what PCOS is, remember it's a condition of excess. Everything is in excess. The weight is in excess. Insulin resistance is in excess. Obesity is in excess. And women who have PCOS and obesity, 10%, 10% is a very high incidence, have diabetes and 35% have an impaired glucose tolerance. So see what the PCOS does to women who have obesity. And many of these women with PCOS will have this lipidemia and all the other problems that are linked with obesity. There are women who have lean PCOS and they fare a little better than women with obesity and PCOS. And look at this, it's an old slide, but a very important slide. It shows that women with PCOS are more obese than age match controls at 31 and also as they are approaching 50. So there is something in build. So it is 
not only genetic, but it is also epigenetic. What we have done to our environment, and remember in India, plastics were introduced into our environment only 35 to 40 years ago. And that is a direct line to seeing how people are becoming diabetic, incidence of cancers, and of course, incidence of obesity. There's a direct link. So epigenetics today is more important than genetics. All the comorbidities that you see with PCOS, oligomenorrhea, hyperandrogenism, diabetes, infertility, hirsutism, the psychological distress that everybody has talked about. Sometimes women who come to our clinic with PCOS and who are obese don't even want to change when we want to examine them. They say, doctor, can we avoid an internal exam? Can we avoid daring to, you know, we always do a breast exam. So they're so obsessed with that they feel shame when they have to expose themselves. So there is a very big mental component that goes with obesity and PCOS. Pregnancy in PCOS, these women are not spared because you see that there are many, many obstetric complications, spontaneous miscarriages, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and preeclampsia. Obese women with PCOS will tend to have these complications. And look at this. When you look at obese women who conceive, you will see that recurrent miscarriage, gestational diabetes, early neonatal death, and their children are not spared. It doesn't just stop at the mother. We see that children who are born of obese mothers have a lot of problems. They can have failure of vaginal birth because they themselves are obese or fat. Instrumental delivery C-sections are much more in these children. And PCOS is a lifelong condition. It can be ameliorated. We can have ways of treating it, but initially it starts with androgen excess and anovulation. And as the woman ages, she goes on to metabolic syndrome and all the complications of metabolic syndrome. So PCOS is a lifelong condition needing lifelong care. It's not just at the time of adolescence or for the sake of having children. And as Dr. Mufi said, even a small weight loss of five to 10% can effectively reduce insulin resistance. The number two wonder drug today in the world, can anybody tell me? Absolutely. The wonder drug today is metformin, which has anti-obesity uses, anti-cancer uses, and becoming now a lifestyle medication. You will see that in the West, many people, and even in India, many people are using metformin. It helps with some amount of weight loss, but brings down the hyperinsulinism, and the, this can aid particularly in women who have PCOS, not only in women who are obese and have PCOS, but also in women who are lean and who have PCOS. So metformin is a wonder drug and can be used very well, can be used even to have natural conceptions in women who are PCOS. But these are the benefits of even tiny weight losses. So if a woman comes to you and says, a doctor, Encourage them. If they say, I've lost only three kilos, say, even three kilos is good. Try to lose at least 5% of your body weight because that really helps. Now, we know that just weight loss with having modifying your meals is not enough. Exercise 30 minutes of physical access, uh, activity, 150 minutes of exercise weekly will help you, your peripheral muscles, to metabolize 80% of the glucose. Doctor, you raised a question about calorie burning. And one of the things is your peripheral muscles, if they burn this glucose, will benefit. So 80% of the glucose can be used up peripherally when you exercise. Then there is a role for yoga. They say that two kinds of exercises, Surya Namaskar, very important, and do about 10 to 15 Surya Namaskars every day, and pranayams supposed to help. So these are very easy, small things that can be incorporated and the general practitioner and the primary physician will play a very important role in encouraging people who are on the verge of having some weight loss to both them on and encourage them to lo lose this weight. So CoQ10, there is a lot of work on CoQ10 and women with PCOS and obese women have a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction. Please understand that when we have eggs, these eggs have a limited amount 
of mitochondria. Just one million copy numbers of mitochondria till it forms an embryo to day five. And most of the women with PCOS have mitochondrial dysfunction and therefore supplementation with CoQ10 to 300 to 300 milligrams a day is very helpful, particularly in obese women and those who have mitochondrial dysfunction with PCOS. We know that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1978 was got by Peter Michel for his work in electron transport chain and the role of coenzyme Q. So lifestyle options, we all have heard this. Exercise, cycling, having enough sleep. Sleep is a very important factor. I make sure that all my women who are coming for IVF get at least that eight hour of quality sleep. And one must avoid the blue light, the computer, the TV, one hour before trying to go to sleep. And of course, Dr. Mufi said not to eat and immediately go to sleep. There are many benefits of intermittent fasting. And in Jains, we know that we can we need to eat early. And Jainism says, propounds the theory that eat before sunset. And today we have seen that people who do intermittent fasting eat by six and sleep and then have the next meal, 16 hours later, tend to lose weight well. It's a difficult proposition to be without food for about 16 hours, but it does work. Now, the health consequences in women with PCO does not stop at them. These are transgenerational effects and they go on to the next generation, the F2, F1, F2, and the F3 generation because there is a very big epigenetic role in PCOS. So children of people who are obese, both fathers and mothers, will tend to have PCOS themselves, have a high AMH, oxidative stress, obesity, and all the other consequences that are associated with obesity. Cancer has already been talked about. I'll just touch upon it. Obesity in the women associated with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, and endometrial cancer. And this is because when there is obesity, there are pro-inflammatory substances like cytokines, TNF-alpha, which all tend to trigger certain genes and, try, and which need to be silenced. These are triggered and therefore they can lead to a particular kind of a tumor. And many of these tumors are linked to estrogen, progesterone, androgen, and also lifestyle changes and epigenetics as well as endocrine disrupting chemicals, common ones being phthalates and bisphenol. So there is a definite relationship between hyperglycemia, hypertension, and low HDL and developing tumorigenesis. Body mass index, as you know, plays a very important role in co comorbidity and mortality because of these types of cancers. So the fat tissue that is present in our body and in obese women, that is the trigger because these will trigger all the inflammatory cytokines, which will then send a pathway to increase the angiogenesis, to unsilence the genes and cause gene mutations in those genes responsible for tumorigenesis. There's a very nice slide comparing obesity and somebody who's going to develop tumors. You will see that the common factors are, there is a multidimensional complexity, there is a progressive phenotype, more towards obesity and tumorogenesis, there is disordered tissue growth, recurrence. Angiogenesis is very important, both for obesity and for tumorogenesis. VEGF alpha, insulin-like growth factor, these are all angiogenetic factors which will blow up obesity as well as tumors. This is a very, very important slide. I love this slide because it gives the comparison very, very clearly. Of course, we know that obesity and endometrial cancer are linked, but women who don't take care of their bodies after developing endocrin, uh, endometrial cancer are more prone to cardiovascular incidence. And this has been very amply shown and Therefore, women who have suffered from cancer need to lose weight even after the cancer to protect themselves from cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So we should not forget the male who can contribute a lot to the female health. If the husband looks after his wife, 
while the children are growing up and contributes to the household, I think women can win many battles because the woman is struggling, looking after the children, looking after the in-laws, looking after the husband, and she's completely neglecting herself. So many women who are obese say, doctor, I don't have, you're telling me to exercise for 45 minutes? Where will I take out those 45 minutes from? How can I look after myself when my children are growing up? So we need to empower the women. And the male who is obese will also have problems. And this is just to show you, it follows the same trend. The cytokines, the epigenetic modifications. Sirtuins are very important factors. And please read up a little about sirtuins. There are seven sirtuins that protect our body and keep the gene modifications in check. And there is a very big link between resveratrol, which is used by many people in obesity, and activating sirtuin 2. So this is some good research work that you can read up on the role of sirtuins. Women and men who are obese, the sirtuin factors are down-regulated in them. And therefore, they benefit from the use of resveratrol. Again, I've talked about epigenetics, which has an impact on our overall health span and lifespan, not only us, but that of the F1, F2, and the F3 generation. And this is you know, a very nice cartoon, which in one second depicts everything. Genetic factors, DNA methylation, histone modification, these are all epigenetic cha changes. And we know in the next slide I will show you, I'll just wait a second because some people are taking photographs. How men who are obese are having sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, diabetes, and all these things can bring about changes in the genetic profile, in the endocrine crosstalk that is required between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the testes, and can even affect the spermatogenesis. One factor which we have seen in our work is that men who are obese and who are diabetic tend to have more sperm DNA fragmentation. And you know that when sperm DNA fragmentation increases, the quality of the sperm comes down and therefore the quality of the embryos come down either in natural conception or with IVF. And women whose partners have high sperm DNA fragmentation are more prone to miscarriages. So this is well known, well established. Men who have high DNA fragmentation their embryos have more aneuploidies, that is more chromosomal defects. So it, we have to tackle these things at the grassroots level. And current data shows that obesity can contribute to the fall in the life birth rate and the clinical pregnancy rate. So I'm the editor-in-chief of the scientific journal, Fertility and Stilty Indian Edition. You will get lots of articles which you can access free of cost. For the last three years, many are related to obesity, many are related to diabetes, PCOS, and I will urge you to go into this journal and get a lot of information free of cost. I thank you for this patient hearing, and I'm so happy to spend some time talking on a topic of epigenetics, part of it, which is very dear to my heart and on which we are doing quite a lot of research right now. Thank you so much for your patience just before listening. Uh, so, may I have any questions? Uh, the name of the book is on why writing books that way. There are many books on epigenetics. First, you say something else. After that, you say scanner. Shana Swan. Shana Swan. S J N A S W A N. Shana Swan is collaborating, she's in USA, but she's collaborating with people in Israel. They're all over the world. Globally, they've done two big meta-analysis. There, they first they look only at the Western continent, and they didn't include Africa and Asia. And they saw, yes, there was a fall in the sperm count over the last 30 to 40 years. We did a study of about 6,000 men, just look, and we hope to do some similar studies here in Israel. Uh, where we showed that over 11 years, there was a significant decline in the sperm parameters, not only in men with male factor, but also in men with non-male factor. So yes, the environment is causing 
a lot of problems and we are responsible for this change in the environment. We have to protect our future generation. Otherwise, our children's children are going to have a lot of problems in the world. Thank you very much. And it was a uh, very pleasant. Uh, it was a pleasure to have this session. This is affecting our lives, but we are not looking at it. So we got our overall view. Thank you very much. We break for uh, lunch. There's one announcement that next month we probably may do a big program 10 to 5 with Dr. Tushar Shah. So that I will let you know the date and time. Please look forward to attending. Thank you very much and a very good day.